Awesome. Um, house full. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Shahid. I work at Hasura, and I tend to shamelessly plug my Twitter handle everywhere I go. So, please follow if you like what you see to here today. I'll be ranting more about these things all the time. Cool. So I work for a company called Hasura. Um, most of you might have got the Hasura stickers and would be wondering what this is about. I'll come to that towards the end. Um, and I would like want to start the talk by introducing a problem. This is something that uh, everybody would be aware of, or you have seen in your life at or at some point. Um, before that, can I see how many front-end developers are here? Just raise your hand. Okay, awesome. Back-end developers? Cool. I, is there any other category of developers here that I'm not aware of? Full stack, okay. Who is full stack? Okay, oh, grass stack, jam stack, a lot of stacks are there. Okay, um, any GraphQL users here? Okay, very few. Um, serverless, serverless functions, function as a service. Awesome. Okay, so most of the stuff might be new for a lot of you, but that's the whole point, right? Cool. So let's see how you how we can build an uh, build a typical application. Um, you have a mobile app, a website, or uh, something of that sort, and you will be contacting a API layer which will be talking to a database, which will again be talking to multiple other microservices, or uh, as always, there's the monolith where everything is there inside. I'm not going to that part because, hey, we are in 2018, right? Like monoliths are what, 1990s maybe? Yeah, anyway, so you have these microservices um, talking to each other, and this particular microservice that I'm introducing here um, we'll be using them throughout the uh, talk and towards the end of the demo also. Um, so just keep them in mind and you might have guessed already what this application does, right? It lets you order food. So any, any thoughts what kind of issues this architecture can have? I'll give you a clue. Two of those issues are in the title of the talk. Any random shout outs? Huh? Yeah, scalability, resiliency, but why? Why is it not scalable? Or I'm, I'm assuming that it's implemented in a naive way, okay? Of course, you can make this scalable. I mean, all of us can do this. But I'm talking about the naive way of doing stuff where uh, you make a request from the application, it uh, hits the API layer, API layer does everything that has to be done. In this case, it's it makes an insert into the database, uh, validates the order, uh, process the payment, and uh, assign a delivery agent. And after doing everything, it returns back to the client, right? So this is a synchronous action. You are doing some something on the client application. It's going through the entire flow on the backend and then coming back to you. Okay, I'm talking about this scenario. So this particularly is not scalable. Um, as always, uh, are, are, do we all agree the fa to the fact that um, synchronous actions are inherently not scalable? Like, you can't do thousands of them at once unless you allocate the required resources, right? Do we agree? Anybody disagree to the fact? Okay. Not, uh, all of you don't have very strong opinions or trying to be very liberal, positive, or taking a nice nap after the lunch. Like, which one is it? Okay, anyway, so resiliency is something that you build into the application layer, right? So what happens if the restaurant microservice, uh, your, your um, interaction with the restaurant microservice fails? Like you need some, that, that microservice is crashed. Like how do you uh, start the process again from that point it failed, right? This is something that you typically build into the API layer. You would write code to do this. Now, um, a typical solution to this problem when we see that most of my issues are due to synchronous things happening in the backend, what is that golden hammer that comes to your mind? Let's make it async, right? Let's make it async. So now I'm making it async. Let's see how an asynchronous uh, architecture look like. So you have the API layer again, you have the database, and you ins make a 
insert, let's say an insert in the database, you have something like a event system, like a Kafka, RabbitMQ, and you will keep inserting events. Other microservices will consume these events. They will process what is meant to be done, right? Uh, any of, most of you are familiar with this architecture, right? Yes, no, yes, okay, awesome. Cool, so this is the typical um, async architecture that we see where you have, uh, uh, you interact with the database, your state is stored in the database and you um, execute certain action based on events happening on the database, right? Nice, but uh, microservices are again like monolith, so 2000s, right? Or maybe, oh, maybe like last year. Today everybody is about serverless. So let's talk about serverless a little bit. So my aim is to replace my microservices with serverless functions so that I don't have to take care of a lot of things, right? So I saw there are very few serverless users here or functions as a service users here. Um, so let me just introduce what serverless is or what, uh, what this lets you do, right? Typically when you need to write a web service, you need, you need an API which tells you hello world, okay? So this is my uh, express code for that. Typically you would write, it, write this func uh, function and then you will have something like uh, app.use or app.listen and you will maybe uh, run this on a typical VM with the VM2 node, whatever, just write it, write away, run it. Or if you are fancy enough, make it a container, docker build, docker push, maybe put it on Kubernetes. How many of you are Kubernetes users? Okay, awesome. So serverless functions or serverless frameworks or serverless platforms, what it lets you do is this. You have, you typically have a command, command line tool or a, or a UI where you just paste this function or you just execute one command which will take this function which is in one index.js file and it will give an endpoint to trigger that function. So this will give me this URL and I can just curl or just call that URL and I get the response. So it's uh, scalable by default or scalable by nature because you are not managing any uh, CPU, RAM or anything. There's no ops, you did not deploy the code, you did not access it into any VM, you did not create any servers, you did not care about CPU or memory and it just works, right? So there's no VM to manage, don't need to worry about scaling and uh, all serverless uh, platforms are scalable by default. You will only talk about the pricing page, you look at the pricing page and it'll say free for a million invocations a month. That itself sounds like scale, right? So you can in, uh, trigger it how many ever times you want um, concurrently. You can trigger it uh, once, twice or ten times at once. So uh, scale for free, I said uh, most of the cloud, pl cloud platforms like AWS Lambda, Google Cloud Functions, Azure Functions. All of them are very generous free tier. You will be able to deploy uh, this to very generous free tier, which is a, like a million invocations per month. Okay. So this is freedom, right? You are, uh, most of us are front-end developers, full-stack developers are here. Like I just want an API to be available for my app to work. I, I exactly know what it does. I don't want to go to the hassle of creating a VM, deploy it and do whatever, right? I, I, I know the function. I know how to write that code. I just want this code to be running somewhere so that I can trigger it using an API call. But is it resilient? So we, we talked about uh, scalability. Is it resilient? If some serverless function fails, how do I restart the same action? How do I trigger the same action again? Right? Serverless functions by themselves are not scalable, no, not uh, resilient. So what you have to do is you need to Draw in some idea of state because they themselves are ephemeral. They don't have any idea of state. So you store your state in the DB, in the database. For example, in the earlier case, you say payment done or not done. You store it in the database. And whenever something changes in your state, you trigger events. You trigger the serverless function on this database events. So what that means is you, when you have this event system and you try to trigger the serverless functions on these events, you and add retrace to the mix, you get uh, resiliency. Let me explain that by taking an example. 
So here in the earlier example, we have this food ordering app, right? You have this schema. This is your table. This is your this is what your order table looks like. Whenever you create a new order, this is the state, right? Now there are four steps here, which is very, which is very important. One is is valid, where the restaurant does the validation. Another one is is paid, is approved, and is agent assigned. Let's look at the flow using the serverless architecture. A new order is placed. Now this is the database state, right? Everything is false. This particular database state will trigger an event, which will trigger an uh, trigger a serverless function, which does whatever logic is required to validate the function. Now that will do the uh, back, uh, whatever logic that is required, and comes back and updates um, the database and says it's validated true. This particular action or this particular event of is validated being updated to true will trigger another serverless function, which will again come back and update the state, and which this kind of this things uh, this continues over all the steps, right? And finally, when everything becomes true, your order is completed. Now, your client just created an order, right? You may place an order from the client, and uh, what happened is you replaced your earlier synchronous microservices architecture with a serverless function. Your microservices become serverless function. Serverless functions are asynchronous and scalable by nature. And uh, when you trigger them using database events, you get uh, resiliency. But what is the cost, right? You don't get anything for free, right? Like you can do all these things, but what is your cost for to do this? Any clues? Like we talked about event system and all. Like it's like something that is available on the road. You can pick it up off the shelf, use it, right? What you did was you moved specific error handling or failure handling logic from the API layer of yours to another system, to a generic failure handling system, which is the event system, right? So the cost is <coughs> in this uh, asynchronous architecture. You need a generic event system which will be able to trigger microservices or serverless functions or whatever, some web hooks or some logic when database actions changes. And you need asynchronous serverless functions. So what we did was we took this architecture, we took the synchronous portion of it, we made it asynchronous by introducing this new architecture. <coughs> Again, what's the catch? There's still a problem, right? Your client made an order. Earlier, whenever the order was completed, the client got an update back. Now, whenever something is happening on the back end, how does the client know whether the order is validated, order is uh, placed? You get a response immediately when you place an order. That's what we showed here, right? You make a database insert, you get a uh, response back. So how does the client know what is happening in the back end? So how do you send these asynchronous things that are happening in the back end to the front end? Yeah, somebody shouted it, GraphQL. So, <coughs> sorry. GraphQL is like this uh, new uh, person in town. Um, so very few people knew GraphQL, so I'll just make a small GraphQL intro. So you have, a typical REST, in a typical REST scenario, you will have this uh, product or this particular endpoints to which you do get, post, patch, all these requests, right? All these methods. And you get response back. So if there's a product and you only want to get the name of the product and nothing else, you would, the backend has to implement something like columns equal to, question mark columns equal to name or something similar, right? So using GraphQL, the query looks like what is there on the right hand side. You, you write something called a query and you say what is it that you want to query and you get what exactly you asked for. And if you want to if you want to query over multiple relationships in a database, this is how you do it. You nest them inside the same object and you get that response back. How many of your React developers? Angular? 
what is the rest of you use view view js how many okay couple of you still jquery huh it's uh, 2019 almost so react has a uh, react and all these modern ui frameworks have this ui or component based architecture right you write a component you use the component everywhere you reuse the component um so when you have a component let's say you have a profile um, user profile component you need to know the user's name a link to a profile picture and let's say the user's location Th three things are uh, needed to render this profile component so you can write a specific graphql query to only fetch this information profile name and the image link and uh, the location and you can wire it up to the component and that's it your library will take care of everything else you don't have to get the response from your rest api transform it to what you want to want it to be to pass to the state of your component all of these things go away and whenever you want something else to be done like how many times has it happened that you were working on a ui component you wanted uh, one more extra field from the backend and you had to call the backend developer and they were like sleeping or i'm on vacation i'm on leave i'll do it as soon as i'm back and your work your work gets put on hold because of that right all these backend front end interactions will go away in this scenario because is one endpoint which exposes everything of course everything that is allowed to be exposed and then you can the front end can decide what they want to see exactly what they want to query exactly so this kind of puts ui first you decide what your application needs to see or what your application need to show on the front end and depending on that you do the database modeling or you make write the right query to get the correct information the amazing thing about graphql is subscriptions now we talked about all these things that is happening in the back end where the order was being validated and uh, your uh, uh, you need to you need some way of sending this back to the client right that's what we stopped earlier so you need some way of consuming async information from the back end without taking care, without worrying about too much stuff so do you know that rest has a watch uh, watch verb how many of you have seen this watch verb or used it somewhere i'm squinting at the kubernetes users out there so kubernetes has this watch method it's not a standard spec i guess but they have implemented it it let you watch over a resource basically it'll open a websocket connection and sends you updates over that websocket connection graphql subscriptions are exactly like that you have a database you will be able to send information to the client not when the client asks for it that's how rest works right your client asks for it you give it back the client of uses let's say the client opens a subscription it's like a websocket connection it is a websocket connection when you will be able to send data from the back end to the front end using graphql subscriptions for example this is our uh, food ordering uh, example um you had a payment uh, this is the order table you had two fields payment is uh, payment and dispatched over time all of both of them becomes true you want to show this on the ui as and when it happens right what would you do all the front end developers out, out there like you have no idea about graphql like how would you do this polling first solution is polling right you keep polling the back end the rest api at a particular interval somebody said sockets now sockets are not something the front developer alone can do right polling the front developer alone can do pardon real time db yeah can you name one real time db firebase anything else yeah lot of couch couch db reflex rethink db lot of real time databases are there how many of you are all actually using them firebase i i i agree many might be using but other stuff and firebase is a nosql database we need to take that also into consideration so 
you the second solution is to use web sockets so web socket there should be a contract between the front end and the back end the back end need to decide on a both parties need to decide on a common contract to send data across right then again the same problems of rest api comes here. what if you want to get one more field in the web socket response right you need to again pay in the back end developer so you do polling you do web sockets custom api but uh, those who have implemented web sockets would understand the community is really fragmented socket.io and all is there but still have you tried making a javascript client talk to a yeah, maybe the other way so integrating different frameworks and different tooling is very difficult because the community there's no set standard which says this is how information should be passed around through web sockets it's up to the implement the developer to decide right the front end and back end developer decides this is how we are going to do it or most of the times one party decides right other one has to just do it so with graphql this comes down to very simple uh, mechanism so the spec is standardized everything is set on stone or in one github repo where the spec is written this is how the client should interact with the server this is how the server should send the information to the client and all clients implement this uh, spec so all clients are compatible with all servers if the server says i am graphql compliant and the client says i am graphql compliant it works Le this means most of the work has already been done by the open source frameworks and libraries out there and you just have to implement them you just have to use them this is what boils down to when you have a uh, when you have to do the thing that i showed you earlier so it just becomes this instead of the query you will say subscription that's all your react framework or your your react library uh, it's called apollo in react uh, most people use apollo and uh, it will be it will get the update from the back end and it will refresh the component automatically so whenever any of these things happen in the back end you will be able to get that update in the front end now of course you need a graphql server with subscriptions right so we took our uh, simpler architecture earlier and made it so complicated and we need all these new things to be done so going back for a comparison this was our traditional architecture we said that that is not scalable because it was synchronous this is my asynchronous scalable architecture and this is my graphql and serverless architecture so you have an application and you have something sitting here you have uh, it, it interacting to the database and you have graphql client is interacting with the server with graphql the server is also triggering serverless functions based on the actions happening on the database which is again updating the database back and so on and so forth so some fun right a lot of uh, theory some practical stuff has to be happen cool but uh, I hope this works. I heard there is conference Wi-Fi. I myself am connected to it, so let's see how it works. Why don't you go and scan this QR code? You will be taken to a page which says "Open or Order App Analytics App." Preferably, go to the Order App, and we'll come to the other ones. So, how do I do this? awesome so what i'm going to do is this is an example application built to demonstrate this scenario so okay i will also do one thing somebody is already messing with the demo awesome okay so i'll keep this on one side we'll play around with the stuff on the other side so guys so when i place a new order what happens is i'll be able to see the status in real time uh whoever is placing this thousands of orders please make sure you pay for the order okay <laughs> otherwise it will be just stuck there nothing will happen post that so these are the number of orders being placed and now this bottom graph are the number of orders being validated okay 
and then the payment happens and then so on and so forth the validation and the restaurant approval happens now while this is going on if you can stop ordering and please listen so i would just like to show you what's happening here so this is the code this is the react application where you are placing the order okay so here is this uh, place order or js function where you are just doing this thing called mutation which is inserting an order item right when you place choose the item it is inserting into a database now i all i did here is to write this query and uh, this on click function is bound to um, yeah we saw that like in talk how this happens so whenever the order is placed this is how it happens this so this is how the items are loaded so you say query and you say return data to item dot map you will say uh, render the item name in a checkbox so compare this to how you would use a rest api you would use fetch call an endpoint get the response pass that response back into the state and then render the component right so here you have a component called query that is available and it just have works right away and this is how you are placing the order mutation mutation is place order and the order gets placed right away so whenever you want to see the status of the order this is what happens you have a subscription this is the this is the live status your order get, keeps getting updated um this is these are the fields that i want to show and these fields are mapped to the component right away so here you can see payment status is shown and the subscription component is being used here and based on that i am rendering this template and the status is rendered by this function now when you place that order oh wow nice guys please please pay pay for these orders no otherwise it won't uh, move forward okay i'm being generous i'll pay for all of you so this is what is happening in the back end there's an order table and whenever you place an order sammy who's l e l l o o o i want to see this person please raise your hand the one who is messing with my demo reveal yourself please no okay we will find you so oh my god Poor server. <laughs> so when you place a new order, what's happening is this serverless function is getting triggered. Okay, so this function is hosted on Google Cloud, um, where you can see validate order. You can see the number of invocations for the last one hour. So it's going pretty high, right? Sixty, seventy invocations per second are happening. So whenever you are doing any action here the corresponding serverless function is getting triggered and you can see it's climbing slowly so this is partly because google's invocations per seconds are very low like 60 server requests per second and you can see that as and when it gets time it happens so let's try to pay for all these orders um Oh my god this person is going to So I'm going to pay for the for pay for all the orders so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to update the order table and set is paid to true where is validated is true 
So those who are familiar with GraphQL will understand what this is. And once that is done, tell me how many rows were updated. So I can execute this query if the internet works, of course. And it'll tell me how many rows were updated. So 18,200 orders have been paid for, okay? So you can see this massive jump here, right? This green jump is due to that order that have been paid right now. So our validate order function is still being very slow in getting invoked. So I will have to resort to my videos because of our said person who is placing infinite orders. So we saw how we can place one order. And whenever we make many orders, this is the ideal situation would look like. So this is what happens, right? When you have a system and you didn't design for the kind of scale that you expect, even if you call the, even if you call it scalable, resilient, whatever, you need to have an anticipation of that scale. Last time I did this demo, I got around 40,000 orders. And I was under the same impression. But yeah, you guys are really awesome. Not you guys or you, everyone, that one person. <laughs> I will find that one person. Okay, whoever you are, come to me after the talk is done. I have some gifts for you. Good gifts. So the idea is whenever, uh, so this is the ideal scenario, the validation will go on. So I only managed, I only configured this to handle such a number of scale. So you will be able to see the validations are going on and whenever all of the orders are pending payment. So when you pay all orders, suddenly the payment thing jumps and the other step which is the restaurant approval continues to happen. And uh, uh, once that has reached a particular state, the next function which is the delivery agent assignment will continue uh, triggering. So now, Imagine building an application which can handle 50,000 orders. Like this kind of scale and all, if you have to handle this, no, you have to work, I don't even know how much. This is just like front end hacking, just a couple of React lines and one database model, that's it done. So let's say when your network breaks down. So I have a demo for that. I don't, can't really show you that on Google system because there's no way of turning off a function. So I'm making some orders. So I have paid some 1000 orders and uh, the validation is happening and payment has also happened. And this is my restaurant approval function. This is on AWS Lambda. This is button called throttle. I click the throttle button and the function just stops executing. You cannot execute it anymore. So this many approvals have been done and this many approvals have been done and the function has been throttled by this time. And this many restaurant, uh, uh, this many delivery agent assignments also have done. After that just flattens or nothing is happening because this function cannot be triggered anymore. So once that, so everything is stuck at restaurant approval. So once I have, I uh, make the function uh, run again where is thousand concurrency I've uh, uh, allocated to it, it will start running. You see that it start running again and everything continues as expected. So there was a network failure in between and because of that network failure, everything stopped executing, but it picked up again when the network was available. So that is how resiliency is achieved. So you can see that um, all of this, uh, you can see all of these invocation logs and everything, uh, where if you go to the events tab, we see the validate order function. And uh, you can see the invocation logs. So you can see that this particular event was delivered. This was the response, this request is the response. And let's see what the order status is. Are we still getting spammed with orders? Ah, it looks like it stopped. Cool. So keep a watch on this link, this analytics app link after the talk is over also, you will see that how the system will handle the scale without any intervention. So I haven't done any tweaks to handle this particular amount of load. This was something that was working for 1000, 2000 orders and see for yourself how the system will handle it. Now, it's nice to see all this in one talk, but
but we have also formally or not formally just put it down in one place uh, if you can go to three factor dot app and you can read about all these principles these architecture principles that i have just introduced right now so we use real time graphql for faster iterations we use event driven uh, for uh, scalable uh, resiliency we use async serverless for scalability so you can check out this link refactor dot app and you can learn more about this architecture that's it that's it from me um the product that i use right now hasura graphql engine that, that is what we do we build graphql on postgres check out the github repo star it it's open source we released just 3 months ago and uh, we have got a huge response it'll be awesome if all of you star it and show them show us more love i mean like have you guys got the stars from school like notebook they'll stick stars right very good star and all i'm not saying the same thing but that's how we feel anyway e w l o o please meet me after the talk any questions or do we have time to for questions yeah uh, let's take a couple of questions yeah and we'll definitely star your repo please say show the same enthusiasm you have shown to place those orders okay if you did that no we could get some i don't know 200 300 more stars uh hi so uh, you have to uh, like you have talked about uh, what are the actually uh, benefits of the graphql and how it is like handling like so many orders uh, but what are the cons like and drawbacks of using it like uh, what are the disadvantages so i mentioned right every at every step when i pointed out all the benefits i also point out the cost what is the cost associated with this it's not technically drawback it's the cost so you need a graphql server with subscription and building a graphql server with subscription is not easy it doesn't come for free unless it's hasura graphql engine which is open source and free but anyway so it's a huge effort so you need if you want to do this on your own it's a mammoth level task and if you particularly want to know about the cons the cons are there with any real time asynchronous system you you need to be able to handle certain race cases and edge cases which will not appear in any synchronous system right the moment you in introduce asynchronous actions or asynchronous pattern in your architecture you need to be able to handle all the scenario that in all the other problems it introduce does it does it make sense so with graphql per se i can't pick out uh, there are issues with the client libraries any new system has its own issues but it's getting better the ecosystem is working towards making it better any other question uh sorry yeah so uh hi right in front of you oh, okay, yeah sorry. hi yeah. yeah sorry so i had a question um uh, from what i've seen where you use graphql typically what happens is that the graphql query gets sent to your server over http post right which sort of makes any type of cdn or any http based caching completely um, useless agreed have have you figured out some way to kind of um, or, or is there any pattern so that i can kind of get the best of both worlds where i get kind of the power of graphql as well as i'm also um not losing out on all forms of http caching so this is one you can say these are the one this is one of the cons right certain things you will be able to cache in your uh, server there is one way which people have tackled this which is to send the query in a get request in a query parameter which is a hack people have done it but the community itself is working towards better caching mechanisms but typically you would not need to worry about it unless yeah at scale you need to worry about this but it's a problem that is being actively worked on there is no sole solution right now 